Hola. And welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about how function parameters are a lot like tuples or structs, and a little bit of a thought about whether they are the same thing or different. I already had to cut things like var args out of this video. Maybe we can get to that someday. Let's see what we can see, starting with Python. Here's our problem for today. We pass in a list of things and a separator and some end cares. We join up those things using the separator and put the end cares on the front and back, returning a string. So we get a listing out of this and we can print it out. We got some rabbit holes to still go down. Let's run this. So we get here, one, two, three, separated by spaces and surrounded by parentheses. That's what we expect. The question is, what does this syntax really mean? And what are function parameters? And to explore this idea, let's consider putting a space in here. When I've been in C proximity programming languages and I'm calling functions, I usually never put a space between the function name and the arguments. I have seen some people do this, and there's some languages where this totally makes a lot of sense. And we'll see Haskell before we're done as an example of that. Meanwhile, of course, Python doesn't care if I have a space here, even if that's unconventional. It still works as before. And in fact, as an alternative, we can actually take a tuple and splat it out, causing the same effect as before. Only, I change the separator. I'll constantly change throughout just to prove that I'm calling the new version of each line. And it does what we expect here. So, what's the difference between these parentheses and these square brackets. Well, in Python, one's a tuple and one's a list. That's their names. What does it mean? I can say a equals a tuple of one and two, b equals a list of one and two. And when I first learned Python a long time ago, the only thing I could tell the difference was the tuples are immutable, constant values, but lists can change. So if I try to say a1 equals three, tuple object does not support item assignment but b1 equals three is fine, and b now has a new value. And I thought, well, it's nice to have things that are immutable sometimes, but why make a completely different type and syntax for it? Because I didn't understand that fundamentally tuples are heterogeneous and positional in the sense that this a is a tuple of an int and an int, but b is a list of ints. And over here on the side, this is a tuple of list string string whereas this is a list of ints. Doesn't mean a whole lot for dynamic typing, but when you start getting to static typing in Python or other languages, the difference can really stand out. And interestingly, the tuple syntax for Python matches the parameter syntax, as well as the argument syntax with parentheses. Though there's a little bit more going on here with the parameters than we get from just basic tuples. And I can define a tuple type as a static type definition for use in type pins in Python these days. Let's say it's a tuple of a list, string, and a string. And instead of splatting it out, I could just pass in a tuple, which feels a bit wasteful at the moment, and which we have to make sure to unpack. But so here, I've taken a tuple and passed it inside of my outer tuple, well, pseudo tuple, into my function. And if we run it, it works just fine. The thing is, this isn't really all that's happening with parameters in Python. Because really, Python parameters are closer to named tuples in the sense that they are positional, but they also expose their names as part of the public API. But for kicks for now, let's just go ahead and create a named tuple just using positional order. So I've passed in my arguments, and I splat it out, which should go into the right parameters here. If I run it, it's doing fine. But on that topic of named things, I could alternatively just pass in names directly into these things. And the order doesn't matter anymore. And in fact, I can take out some of these and rely on the defaults. And just like I could splat a tuple into there, I can double splat a dictionary into it. Where again, I can have the defaults take over. 
Alternatively, I could define a function that just receives a dictionary. And it would be awesome if I could destruct it in this fashion. But no can do. I can be manual about it. As long as I have a dictionary type instead of a tuple type at this point. So that's nice. But let's go back to the tuple. And in fact, using our name tuple, we can construct an instance with names and then splat it positionally if we want. Or again, order doesn't matter inside of here, but it does matter up here. Whoa. Okay, so that's where it was before. If we want to double splat names back out again, we can use a similar syntax to as if we were doing named arguments by calling the dictionary constructor. And finally, we can get our named tuple double splatted such that we construct it with names and destruct it with names calling the underscore as dict method, which is a public part of the named tuple API. It's just got an underscore in front of it so that you don't accidentally name one of your own fields that. Finally, as before, we could technically be using a typed dictionary, which is just a dictionary, except with typing annotations. This literally just creates a dict which is why I can double splat it directly. And then finally, we have another alternative in Python, which is a data class, which is some ways like a named tuple, but more flexible and stores a dictionary internally instead of an ordered list of values. Though you still can construct it in order or by name. And you just get out the contained dictionary object. Again, to prove positional works as well, we can do this. At least by default, there's lots of options available on data classes. And while editing this video, I also discovered that Python 3.10 is adding a new feature to data classes, making them more like parameters than ever. You can specify a keyword only spot where anything previous is keyword or positional, anything after is keyword only, such as with the standard syntax that already existed for function parameters. So we've seen a number of data types in Python that are in some ways very similar to the implicit data type of the function parameters. We've also seen how often these days in Python, there's more than one way to do it. Tim Toady, y'all. Let's go on to TypeScript. Here we have a very similar implementation with positional parameters. Only, unlike in Python, these are positional only. I have the names internal to the function, but they're not part of the public API of the function itself. I can only call them positionally. Let's run this. We get our one, two, three, spaces separator, and parentheses around. And of course, again, I can act like I'm passing in a tuple, but there's no such thing as tuples in the JavaScript language. However, there is such a thing in the TypeScript typing language. So I can splat this array here and say that it's of type listing args, which is a tuple that has positions items, sep, and ends, where the names don't mean a lot in the execution, but might be helpful to a human. But their types are an array of unknown, a string, and a string. And if I cast this array as a listing args, I can splat it into my function. And to emphasize the difference between a tuple type in TypeScript and a normal array type, I purposely made this version of the function generic, though it's not terribly useful. So that when I see the inferred type, we can see that's inferred to be an array of numbers as opposed to being inferred as a tuple of int, int, int. And there's some other options available inside of our typing of tuples in TypeScript that we're not going to get into today. But to make our function a bit more interesting, let's go on to default parameter values. All right here, get the defaults of square brackets and commas. But what happens if I wanted to splat this out here? and get a default in this place. Well, I would also have to change my type definition to make these optional. So now it's not required, and when I splat it in, I get the default ends. As a side note, one of the fun things you can do in JavaScript is to put your defaults before a required value, and you can just pass in undefined instead to get those defaults.
but it's not too exciting today. And I'm not sure I recommend that generally. Although if we look at hacks, it's a little more interesting. In this language, you actually can have defaults and optionals that statically are known not to match. So you can just leave out the value for i and it gets a 12 here and foo goes in for s. That's all we'll see of hacks today. Let's look instead at named parameters in TypeScript, which we can make using an object type here. So now we pass in a single object, which is sort of like passing in a single dictionary in Python, except this is the only way really to get named values into a function is through objects. Though nicely, we can destructure right here in the parameter list, including giving default values. So let's run this here. And we see it works as expected. Semicolons and space to separate, no end pieces. And the defaults do work. Noting that I put the question marks to make them optional in my type definition. However, what if we wanted to define a common place for these default values instead of inside of each individual function? One straightforward way to do that would be like in Python with the defaults inside of these type definitions. And one way to do that in TypeScript is with a class. So for example, I can make a class here that has optional parameters and then assigns them if not given. And that's great in the sense that it's named coming into here, but it's not named in my usage of it. So one alternative to this would be to pass instead a listing args object to my class, then object assign it, and make sure to let TypeScript know that yes, I promise that items is being assigned. And so here we can name it, have defaults defined in a class, and receive them here, at which point we shouldn't need these defaults anymore. Except we need to prove to TypeScript that we're serious about it. This effectively defines one where they're all required. Another alternative could use our splatting to construct objects where we have a default set of values here and I can splat them into a new object and just override the ones I care about. We'll see this idea again when we get to Haskell. And as a side note, as much as I love named things, for those who just want positional arguments, there is a nice new feature available in the new VS Code making use of the latest TypeScript that will put names in front of your positional arguments. Might be handy for some code bases. But let's move on to C. And I want to take a look at C because fundamentally we're seeing the same concept here, only instead of tuples, which aren't really a thing in C, we'll use structs instead for named or positional, sort of like our named tuples were in Python. And to avoid being too fancy, I just hard-coded everything to being an int here, since it's all I'm using in the other languages today anyway. So I have an array of ints, and I can call my listing function, where I pass in a separator, bounds, and the items themselves, and I can print the result when I'm done. I'll spare you the details of the implementation. Let's run it. We get our parentheses and our space just as we want it. And again, to point out that in a sense, these parameters are sort of like a struct definition. We can swap out to call a function where we actually pass in a struct value. And the struct has our separator ends and our items. Constructed positionally, but brought out by name. Working fine. And since these are structs, we could use designated initializers to do named field initialization. Although in C, we don't get default parameter values nor default struct field values either. We'll see that in C++ though. Here in C++, my listing function takes an initializer list a separator and some ends, where separator and ends both have default values. And it does the work using a string stream. We'll skip that. Let's run it. And we see our parentheses surrounded, space separated, list of numbers. And as I mentioned, we have default values 
So let's get them. There's a square brackets and commas for default. Now unlike C, C++ actually has a standard type in the standard library for tuples. And so I've defined a tuple here of initializer list, string, and string, well, string view. And then you can receive that, destructure it like we saw possible in Python and TypeScript, and then call our other version of the function. Although, just like Python, we can only destructure positionally and not by name. And my editor hates this, but my compiler's fine with it. We see our expected separator and empty surroundings. But of course, just like in C, we could use structs here also. With the added bonus that we can now easily assign default values because that's a thing in C++. So we get our comma and square brackets by default. We can also use named field initialization here and even skip ones we don't care about as long as they have a default. So we get our commas in between and our empty ends in this case. We have to initialize these in order even if by name, but we can skip some. Okay, having done a tour through languages that pass in parameters as pseudotuples through parentheses, let's look at one example of a language that just cuts to the chase, and that's Haskell. In Haskell, by default, we have curried functions. That is, when we have multiple arguments, really, we have a function that takes a value and returns a new function that takes another value that returns a new function that takes another value until we're done having functions. In this case, we just have a string at the end. So I can print out my text where text is a listing of one, two, three, separated by semicolons, surrounded by square brackets. And that's what we get out. And our data type really is here, a list of something that's printable and a string gives us another function that takes a string that gives us a string once we're all done. And that's what type we have for text. And instead of using this curried version of the function, we could pass in a tuple instead. We just pattern match it to destructure our tuple. And so notice I have a space here because this is the right way to think about things in Haskell. Every function takes one argument only. So listing is receiving one argument, that's a tuple, instead of having pseudo tuples as parameter lists. Let's run this, and we get the output we expect. And technically, we could delete that space and be unconventional. And now it looks like we're calling a function like our other languages and their syntax. But really, we're just passing a tuple in and defined as such here, a function from tuple to string. This is an uncurried function. And if you want to, you can use this data.tuple.curry package to get all kinds of automatic currying and uncurrying for quite a length of arguments for your function in case you want to automatically convert back and forth between curried and uncurried. And that's great, but what happens if I want named arguments? And one way to go about this in Haskell is to use records, which are in some ways like structs. They focus on named fields. So I've defined this record type here with listing args to construct it. And I'm using named field puns as a language extension to make it easier to destruct it here. OCaml and some other languages have anonymous structs, so I don't have to say this name here, but it's not too much overhead for the moment. Then I can pass in named values, pattern match to destruct them automatically, and the body of my function stays the same. And again, all well and good, but what if we want default parameter values? There might be a number of ways to do this in Haskell, but one of the common ways is to define a set of default values for your type. So here I have basically taken these default values and overridden one of them to create a new record and pass that in, in which case I get the default square brackets and commas if that's what I want. This is a lot like what we saw in TypeScript with this default splatted into my object. So is the view taken by Haskell and similar languages correct? Do all functions just take one argument? And can we do anything with some kind of data type of what you could do with your parameter list instead? It might depend on how you want to look at it and what are the features of your language. But this is one nice, simple worldview here. Anyway, I hope this has been fun. Maybe we can dig deeper into other kinds of parameter features in the future, including var args. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Ciao.